Hi, welcome to the Scratch 101 tutorial that will cover the basic concept of Scratch and Scratch Lab. When starting Scratch for the first time, the software will come up with a license activation dialog. From here, you can activate your license key. If you do not have a license, you can also use Scratch as a free player. I have a valid license key, so I can paste it in the top text slate and press the activation button. Remember that you need to be online to activate the software. Once activated, the software needs to restart. On Windows this will be automatic, while on OS X you will need to manually do it. From the initial screen of Scratch, you can manage your user profile and create new projects. One of the first things that you want to do when you start working with Scratch is to create your own user profile that will hold your personal settings. Use the Manage Profile button to enter a new profile. Here you can also link the local user profile with your Maya Simulate account. If you do, you synchronize all your Scratch personal settings and Scratch Gallery items with your online account so that they are available from any Scratch system that you work with. Next, let's create a new project. You enter the name of the project in the central text slate and press the Add button. Before entering the project, we first check the project settings. One of the most important settings is the project media path that sets a virtual root folder for your project. This will make it easier to move, copy or use your project on another system. We'll set our project path to our external drive. In the middle section of the project settings menu, you see various project default settings like resolution and frame rate. Keep in mind that these are just defaults. Scratch can handle multiple resolution, frame rates and color spaces in a single project and you can adjust any of the settings at any time in the project. Now let's return back to the main screen. Before entering the project, have a look at this button on the far right. These buttons open the folder where Scratch stores and log files, with lots of information about the internal functioning of Scratch. Whenever you get in touch with us, the Assimilate support, please always include a log file. Now let's enter the project that we just created by using the center button. When you enter a project, the first thing you will see is what we call the construct. The construct has two dimensions. Horizontally, it is a timeline, where shots are stored in separate slots. Vertically, multiple versions of a shot can be stacked up inside each slot. Scratch does not require you to set up a library or a media pool, and I can load a shot straight away. The Load Clips button opens the Scratch Fire browser and from there you can navigate to the shot that you want. When you open a single shot, Scratch attaches the shot to your cursor, so you can drop it in any of the slots in the construct. Let's drop it on the first slot. Now that we dropped this shot in our construct, you can quickly scroll through the shot by dragging the top scroll bar of the thumbnail. You can also review all the available metadata for that shot by opening the metadata stack, swiping to the right. Next to basic items like name, timecode and real ID, you will also find lots of additional metadata that are included by modern day cameras. Back to our shot. When selecting a shot, a play icon is shown. When clicking the shot again, you open the shot in the player. The player is where you do most of your creative work, editing, grading and compositing, and of course, playback of your media. You can adjust the position or size of the image in the top part of the player by panning it, hold down the spacebar and drag the image, 
or hold down the Alt key and drag the mouse. Or you can use any of the buttons in the toolbar. For now, let's go back to the construct to show you how to load multiple shots at the same time. I click here to close the player and then select the second slot as the starting point for loading additional clips. Now, we use the same load clips button as we did earlier, but in the file browser we select the multiple shots option. When selecting this, the depth option comes available. The depth settings allow you to control how multiple clips are placed in the construct. Based on the hierarchy of your folder structure on disk, you can load a single shot per slot or load a number of shots as version in the same slot. The depth option is explained in other more detailed tutorials. For now, let's set this value to 10 to make sure that each clip is placed in its own slot. Next, you select the root folder from where to load the media and set a file filter to only load red footage. It is important to always try and set the file filter, otherwise Scratch will try and open any file it encounters with all available codecs and the loading process might take a lot of time. Next, we press open. As you can see, Scratch loaded each clip in its own slot on the construct. And even though Scratch ordered the shots as it encountered them on the disk, this already represents a timeline. In the construct, you can move shots around by picking them up and dropping them elsewhere. Or you can make a copy by holding down the Alt key when picking them up. As said earlier, the construct represents a timeline as well as a visual library of all the versions of each shot. The main properties of this timeline are determined by the main output node of the construct. When selecting output, we are presented with the output view of the current construct. The first icon there represents my timeline. The second is my main output. When we select that, all the settings on this output are displayed in the menu below, such as frame rate or resolution. You can change these properties at any time. Remember when we looked at the property defaults? Those settings were set as the default for any construct created in the project, but as you can see, we can adjust individual construct at any time. So let's go back to the construct and then into the player to review the creative tools more closely. This time, rather than clicking an individual shot, I will click the play button in the main toolbar, and that will open the player with the full construct. You can now play and scrub through the entire timeline by dragging the cursor in the mini timeline or by using the player controls. Next, let's have a look at the creative tools that you have in the player. First, let's open the editor. By right-clicking anywhere in the player, a pop-up menu appears to switch between the tool sets. In the editor, you can change the timing of shots. Slip the in point, create new edits, add transition, and move or add complete shots. As you can see, the editor brings you all the tools to create and adjust a timeline. The next stop is the matrix toolset. The matrix is where you do all your grading and compositing. Now, please note that the matrix toolset might look different depending on the version of Scratch that you have, Scratch or Scratch Lab. Scratch Lab only has the primary grading feature whereas Scratch has the full set, secondary and compositing on layers. I'm showing the full set here. So let's have a quick look at the grading tools and how to work with new versions. Let's uh, first apply a basic grade using the level menu, adding more red and just making the image darker. Now, when we are happy with this look, we can create a version of the shot 
and then continue to work on it to create alternative looks. Swipe to the right of the UI to open the sidebar. Simply click the Add Version button and Scratch adds a version of the shot. Now we can create an alternative version, again using the various color control. For this, let's create a colder look. So add a bit of blue and make the image maybe a bit lighter. Then we create a third version and this time we want to do something different. For example, go to the numeric controls and just take all the saturation out. Done! So now I've created three versions of the same shot. You can click each of them on the version stack to select and modify them. Alternatively, you can select the dual view mode of the player from the toolbar menu and drag and drop any of the versions in the right pane to compare. You can also use the wipe mode for even closer comparison. Use the overlay control to wipe through the view. If I now return to the construct, you see that the slot has filled up with the three versions that I've created. The next step that I'd like to show you is how to manage your output. So far, we have set up a basic timeline and added some grades. Now it's time to render out this work. Managing output is done from the output menu. As mentioned before, each construct has a main output node. We can render out that node to, for instance, a JPEG or a TIFF sequence, or we can add additional output nodes. Let's add, for instance, a ProRes QuickTime output. In addition, we can also add an MXF output. And of each of those outputs, we can adjust the resolution. So let's make the MXF output an HD output. As you can see, the proxy size is adjusted to reflect the resolution of the output. This way, we can build a complete pipeline of outputs with each node representing a specific target. To actually render out any of the output nodes, select it and then press the process button. Notice the icon and the progress indicator in the proxy, as well as the disk icon in the construct. The render will continue in the background as long as you remain in the project and you can just continue to work on any parts of your project. But let's abort the render for now. Finally, I'd like to show you the project tree, which you can toggle on and off by swiping the mouse to the left. A Scratch project is basically a collection of constructs. You can create additional constructs and manage those in groups. By selecting Edit in the project tree, you toggle the project tree in edit mode and you can rename any of the items. So let's rename the first group to Daily Media and rename the existing construct to Day1. Next, let's add two more constructs using the Add button and then rename those to Day2 and Day3. Next, you can create a new group and rename that to Conforms and rename the construct to Real1 and add another one and called Real2. By the way, conforming media from an EDL or other external file is covered in more advanced tutorials. As you can see, the project tree allows you to easily manage all your media and support your workflow. In addition to creating new groups and constructs, you can also drag and drop them to change the order, or even create versions of a construct by holding down the Alt key when dragging constructs. That is it for now. Let's leave the project by selecting the exit button and we're back to the start screen of Scratch. Thank you for viewing this Scratch 101 tutorial and please know that there are plenty more tutorials and documentation available. Bye!